Okay, well, welcome. Um, great pleasure today to introduce Professor Sadala Gottlieb, a good friend of mine. It's good to have her here visiting. Um, Sigal is a professor, a chancellor's professor of mathematics at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, she was the founding director of a center for scientific computing and data science in Boston Place. Um, it's been a very successful center that brings together interdisciplinary groups of people from across campus that continue to be here. I know a fair about, bit about it because I've been happy to be on advisory committee for several years, so I get to hear about all the great things going on there. So there's lots of good stuff going on. Seagal is well known for her research. She was um, elected as a fellow at Siam, also recently the Association for Women in Mathematics. Um, her research has concerned mostly high order methods for hyperbolic partial differential equations. Um, she's worked on endospectral methods, renal methods, which are weighted essentially non-assimilatory methods. And she's also worked a lot on ordinary differential equation methods that couple well with high order spatial visualization, so strong stability preserving methods, and I'm sure we hear about some of those today. Um, oh, and I <laughs> once mentioned when I was um, looking around on the web this morning as I was driving into campus, I wanted to remind myself of the title of your talk. So on my cell phone, I googled Seagal Gottlieb Boeing lecture, and nothing came up. I thought that's strange, and then I realized that then the spelling correction. I was looking for the Gal Gottlieb boring lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy to tell you that I've Nothing. never given a boring lecture. That is a relief. <laughs> I've certainly never heard you give one, so I think we're in for a treat. So I'll turn it over to Gal. Well, I hope the uh, website won't have anything new to report after today. <laughs> So I'm going to talk, I'm really promising a lot in this talk. I'm talking about developing high order, efficient, and stable. And you know, usually two out of three is pretty good, but we're actually promising all three here. Um, time evolution methods that use a time filtering approach. So the history of this project is that I was supposed to be visiting uh, Bill Layton in University of Pittsburgh, and I couldn't go, and I asked him if he wants us to do it remotely. This was before the pandemic. And, or if he wants me to come later, or if he wants me to send my students, he said, well, we could do all three. Um, so we, we, we did some combination of that. And I had sent uh, Zach Grant to go and talk to them. And Zach Grant uh, spent a few days working with Victor DeCaria, who was at the time a graduate student there. And then later on, Zach Grant and Victor DeCaria both ended up at Oak Ridge National Lab. There, neither of them are still there. But they carried out this project in many different senses. And there were a few things that I liked about this project. First of all, it really, a real collaboration between four people. And that's not, you know, there are a lot of points of contact there. That's not very usual. So that was a nice thing for us. The other thing is, it was someplace where we could feel really useful, where Victor DeCaria and Bill Layton came to us with a problem, and we could figure out how to put it in a setting that made it amenable to solutions and to things that you wouldn't have thought of. And from a personal point of view, this actually involves three different approaches that Zach and I and had taken over the years. It involved an optimization code that actually was initially developed by David Ketchison while I think he was still here, and uh, that for strong stability preserving methods. We did not get strong stability preserving methods here. So this is one of the first works that did not have strong stability preserving methods. It used an error inhibiting, sometimes known as a superconvergent or a quasi-consistent approach, uh, which is, I was working on another project, and it was using this time filtering approach that I had never heard of before. So I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but this is what Bill Layton told me. He said that we're starting with legacy codes that are monsters. And the one thing you don't want to do is go in there and change anything in the time evolution. It's deeply embedded. It has an implicit step that you are not inclined to touch. And you're able to run that implicit step at any point, but you do not want to change it. On the other hand, that implicit step is usually a backward Euler method. It's only first order accurate. And you really want a higher order method. You also want a method that improves on the original solution. Maybe it reduces some sort of discrete curvature. It enhances, certainly, the accuracy. 
um, or it dampens fluctuating scales. I'm going to focus on the accuracy enhancement and stability enhancement for this talk. And actually, we did that for most of our project as well. Um, so the punchline, there's one thing that you'll get out of this talk, is that we wanted to reformulate these time filter approach to look like what are called general linear methods. We'll explain all of those terms over the course of the talk. And this will allow us to apply approaches that we're very familiar with in order to develop methods that are high order, efficient, and stable, and that don't touch the delicate working of the legacy code in a way that would be harmful, or actually in any way that could break anything. So very much use it from the outside. OK, so this is the problem that Bill Layton presented to me. He said, look, I have here a filtered Euler scheme. So at my height, there's an angle issue. All right, this is a backward Euler. And this is, in blue, what my legacy code does. And I don't like it very much because it's only first order but I also don't want to mess with it. So what I do is I take the result that comes out of here, the y1, I put it here, and I subtract out uh, combinations of y1 and un and un minus 1. And if you look at that combination, that looks a little bit like a diffusion term, and it's entering with a negative sign. So it's an anti-diffusive type of filtering. And we have the nice stability conditions coming in from the first stage, the implicit Euler, the legacy code stage. And we have the improvement in order of accuracy and also in some of this diffusive step. The thing about backward Euler is it diffuses the heck out of everything. And so you're able to recover a little bit of that, steepen things a little bit by putting this anti-diffusive step on it. So they like this approach. And they said, how can we generalize this approach? So we said, well, the first thing you can do, and this is kind of easy, is add a pre-filtering as well as a post-filtering step. So simply take an average of two, the previous step and the most recent step, and use that, put that into the legacy code, use that as the basis for your backward Euler, and now you have another filtering in here that is a post-filter. Now, we've already cleaned this up. So we only have one parameter, d. And you can get this to be second order by any choice of d gives you a second order method here. It is three stages, but two of those stages are explicit. So in the big sense, it doesn't cost you any more than the Euler's method, but it gives you a higher order accuracy and maybe even some nice, possibly, some nice... Uh, properties that you want. So what happens here is that your value of d tells you what kind of properties can you expect to get. So we played with this a little bit. We said, well, with uh, the initial Layton's method is what happens when you set d equals 0. If you set d equals 1, this becomes a method that's a little bit different. If you compare these two methods on a simple test problem, you see that in blue you have the errors for the backward Euler. In, yeah, in red, you have the errors for Layton's original filter. And in black, you have um, the d equals 1. We called it a leapfrog because it looks a little leapfroggy. It's not leapfrog. Um, and what you see is that the errors are significantly lower with the d equals 1 case over the d equals 0. So that's nice. It's nice to have lower errors. But also, you see that the slope over here is a first order slope. You can look at that. If you divide out here the rise over run, you'll see that that's a first order slope. This over here is a second order slope. Both of these are second order slope, but clearly there's an error constant that's lower. You just start lower, you end up lower. So those are two easy ways of doing things. You don't need any kind of analysis for this. But now we said, can we push this a little bit further? So how do I choose good values of this parameter d? And here enters the fact that we can write this method as what's called a general linear method. So typically when we have a numerical method, we 
choose between two different types. We either use a multi-stage method, like a Rangakata method, or we use a multi-step method. But there's no reason to choose between them. They both come from a larger family of multi-step, multi-stage methods, otherwise known as general linear methods. So both of these methods can be written as a general linear method. And we can look at this general linear method. Now, the thing about general linear methods is that we have a whole theory for them. We know how to analyze their stability. We know how to analyze their accuracy. So we put an, that information into an optimization code that's still very much based on David Ketchison's optimization code. And we see what is it that we can optimize. So we try to optimize for strong stability preserving. It doesn't work. And you can see immediately from the values of D that it won't work. So we, we didn't do that for too long. Um, but one thing that we thought of is, well, these things can be second order. But I have a little bit of degrees of freedom. I can satisfy one more order condition. Now, when you do a Rangakata method, and this is true of a GLM as well, if you want first order, you have, other than the consistency condition, one order condition. If you want second order condition, you end up with two order conditions. If you want third order, you end up with fourth order conditions. And it goes downhill from there. So I can't satisfy all of those order conditions for third order. I don't have enough freedom to satisfy two more order conditions. But I can satisfy the order condition that would come into play if I have a linear problem. If I have a linear problem, I have one order condition for first order, one, order, one additional order condition for second order, one additional order condition for third order, one additional order condition for fourth order, and so on. Now, I'm not interested in only linear problems, but sometimes it's beneficial to give an extra order condition that would only work for linear problems over being second order. So this method is second order, but it's third order if your problem is linear. And more importantly, it captures the linear components in third order accuracy. So you can expect it to be a little bit better. So when I optimize for this, when I solve this additional method, and you're looking at this and saying, do you really need an optimization code for it? Well, if you want to do the stability analysis, you do. For what we're doing right now, you don't. Um, it's just one more order condition. You can solve it. If you choose this funny value of D, this gives you second order across the board and third order if you're using a if you're solving a linear problem, third order on the linear components, or if a linear component dominates. Now, if I want to add more steps, I can get a third order accurate method. So here I have a sample third order accurate method. Um, this was something that we got just by playing around with it. This wasn't an optimization code thing. Um, but we use the optimization code to, to start with, these, with this type of method and see if we can do better. What do we mean by doing better? We want to see what's the region of stability here. Now, general linear methods have a lot of behaviors that are in common with Rangakata methods, which are a subset, and a lot of behaviors that are in common with multi-step method. Unfortunately, they sometimes seem to inherit the shortcomings of both types of methods. So we seem to... to suffer from the fact that we can't really get very high order methods that are A-stable when you use a general linear method. If you use a Rangakata method, you can. If you use a multi-step method, you can't. Right? There's a Dahlquist barrier that tells you you can't. If you use a general linear method, you'd think you're putting in all of that. It's not so good. OK, so we're not going to be able here to get an A-stable method for this problem. But we can get A alpha stability region. Are you guys familiar with A alpha stability regions? I'm getting a few thumbs up. Who wants me to tell you about A alpha stability region? OK, I'll tell you about A alpha stability region. So the idea is that when you look at A stability, you're looking at stability on the entire left half plane. And what that means for me is that if I have imaginary axis eigenvalues, it captures them and you're good. But a lot of the rest of the world does not care about the imaginary axis stability. Some people in the world are not doing purely hyperbolic conservation laws with the right types of methods. So they have eigenvalues that don't live 
on the imaginary axis. They live to the left of the imaginary axis. And then what we look at is a slice of the imaginary axis. Think of putting a wedge in, and that wedge captures what your axis looks like. You'll see in a minute what that, and the angle of that wedge, alpha, is what A alpha stability region is. So the equivalent of A stable would be A 90 degrees, where alpha is 90 degrees. So 90 degrees is where I'm going for. Do I get 90 degrees? No, I get 71 degrees with this method. So that's not so great. But if I start by using this method and expand it with more steps, or put it into the optimizer and change my coefficients, I can do a little bit better. So let me write this method as a general linear method. Now this gets messy, and hopefully the colors help a little bit. But it, it really is a little bit ugly. Um, I want to tell you what the big picture is. The big picture is that I start with a method that is written in blue. That is my core method. That is the method that is given to me, that lives inside the legacy code, that I do not want to touch. That method comes in with coefficients that I'm going to call D tilde, A hat, and A, the whole bunch of coefficients, and I do not want to change those. So what I do as my preliminary step is I pad this with a first stage that does exactly nothing. The first stage is called UN. Why am I doing this? Because I want to change the first stage, but not yet. So I rewrite my method. My core method is written in this way in the middle, and it has a UN in the very beginning. And then it has the output from the method as the final stage. And again, I'm going to want to change that, but not yet. So the, the middle line here in blue, that's my core method. I haven't written it as a GLM in any significant way, but now you see my core method used to look like a Rangakutta method. Like a, well, it used to look like a GLM. Now it looks more GLM-y than before. What do I mean by this? If you have a hat equal to zero, and if most of your Ds are zero except for the first one, then you get a Rangakutta method back. Okay, then you start with UN, and that's only UN, no other Us. And you don't have F of old Us, but you have F of the other stages. That's a Rangakutta method. So if you set most of the D tildes equal to zero, except for the very first one, or the very last one, I can never remember which way I order this, except for the one corresponding to UN. If you set all the A hats equal to zero, then you get a Rangakutta method. On the other hand, if you set all the A's equal to zero, then you get a multi-step method. If your A's and A hats are non-zero, you have a general linear method. Now, if I want to pre-process or pre-filter the method, I change the first row. If I change the first row, I can rewrite the second row as something a little bit different than it was. I can move things around. But that's just how I write it. That's not how I implement it. So I'm going to be doing analysis on a method that I have modified with the coefficients that I've modified. But my computation is always performed with a legacy method with just changing the pre-filter and not showing how that impacts the other coefficients. And to post-process the method, I simply modify the final line. OK, so to start from the beginning, I change my first row around. Instead of just having UN, I now put a whole collection of old stages. That pre-filters my method. My Second stage is left absolutely alone. I can't touch it. It's in my legacy code. And third stage and fourth stage, I don't know. It's in the legacy code. I don't touch it. I let it be. My final stage takes the output from my legacy code and combines it in this way. Now, over here, I have to be a little bit careful. I'm assuming that I have access to the intermediate stages in my legacy code. If I don't, I have to kind of set this equal to zero, but maybe not exactly. So I have to make sure that my coefficients are chosen so that the method, my new method, my post-processor, is not intrusive. It doesn't take information that in, is not given to me for my method. 
And I don't always know what meth what's given to me from the legacy code. I have to ask. I have to ask, do I just get the final output? Do I get the intermediate stages output? What is given to me from that? And I have to make choices accordingly. Now, changing the method in the first line changes the formulation in the second line. Not the implementation, just the formulation as a GLM. It actually impacts what happens later on only in terms of the theory, only in terms of writing it, not in terms of implementing it. So now we approach the design of the pre and post filter as an optimization problem. We are given the coefficients of the core method in blue. We choose my, post, my pre and post filter coefficients in the following way. First of all, we need to make sure they're not intrusive. We need to make sure that I'm only handling information that's given to me for my method. Second of all, I need to make sure they satisfy the order conditions. I can do additional things. I can make sure that the method is low storage and I don't have to reuse too many values. And finally, I want to define some additional objective function. Maybe that's the stability. Maybe it's some other positivity preserving properties, which didn't work, by the way, but we tried that. Uh, maybe we want to minimize our error constants. Since we know from the general linear method formulation what my errors look like, not exactly, but what the coefficients of the errors look like, we can try to minimize those. We came up with a whole bunch of new methods, some that were based on um, implicit Euler, the backward Euler method, some that were based on the trapezoid rule, on the midpoint rule, on BDF methods, or on fully implicit Rangakata methods. So the following is kind of a display of what we did, how we did it, what the results looked like. So we started, this was fun. So when I was presenting a much older version of this talk at a conference, uh, we didn't look at BDF because Bill Layton didn't want us to look at BDF. He wasn't using it at the time. And Eli Turkel said to me, can you do this with BDF? And I said, well, I could formulate it with BDF. I don't know what the results will look like. And while I was giving the rest of my talk, Zach, on his laptop, formulated the optimization problem and found the following methods. So this over here is not the method that he found. This over here is how I write a pre and post filter for BDF2. It has coefficients D1, D2. They're on the next slide. But the interesting thing here is that my stability region is an A-alpha stability region with alpha being 89.62 degrees. Now that's not what I want because I want imaginary axis stability. But for anybody who wants A-alpha stability, that's pretty good. That's pretty close to 90 degrees. Um, just to show you, the blue parts over here this is done with Randy's code. We do all our stability regions with, with modifications of Randy's code. So uh, the region here in blue is what's stable. So pretty much you don't see far enough out. But everything is stable aside from this yellow thing. This kind of looks A-stable when you look at it on the left. But when you zoom in, you see that it's not A-stable. It juts in just a little bit. And if you imagine a wedge that goes through like that, that's an 89.62 degree wedge. Okay, not a stable, but pretty good. Now we can filter a trapezoid rule as well. I assume, I can't remember now, I think that, that Bill had a trapezoid uh, rule code that he was using, and that's why he wanted us to pre and post filter that. So again, we can pre filter and post filter. You see in my formulation here, I use Y1. I just input that. The legacy code doesn't care what I put in. I put in UN, I put in Y1, it's fine. As long as I keep to the original rule and it looks the same, it's happy. And this method over here um, has a whole bunch of coefficients which don't look so pretty. Uh, the first set of coefficients here gives me a third order method. The second set of coefficients give me a fourth order method. Um, we tested this method, a similar kind of problem. This is the graph. If you really like tables, I'll go back to the previous one. But this is the graph over here. And you see immediately, right, 
that the blue trapezoid, implicit trapezoid rule is second order. It has that kind of error going down. The red line is the trapezoid rule with the P3 filter. So it is third order. The errors are significantly better. And moreover, that slope is significantly better. And the fourth order is in green. And again, the errors are better and the slope is better. So we're able with this pre and post processing to get the type of accuracy that we are looking for, importantly, without messing with the method itself internally. We can do this for a fully implicit Rangakata method. This is another one of those things that I don't think anybody's ever going to use this method. Certainly, I'm not planning on using this method. But the implicit Rangakata method is A stable and it's L stable. And by pre and post filtering it, I get a scheme that is um, third order. And it is A-stable. It is not L-stable, but it is A-stable. So we were pretty happy with that. That was a good method. That was, we, we did a lot of um, multi-step methods as our core methods. And as a Runga Kutta person, I felt like I needed to do a Runga Kutta method as like my core method. I'm not tremendously sure how this is useful, but it shows that we can do it if we wanted to. OK, I want a third order scheme that is A-stable, that is based on an implicit Euler, that is easy to implement. I want an awful lot. Okay, This is where I'm talking about efficient, high order, and stable. So this method over here is a uh, method that we devised Actually, this did come out of an optimization code. Usually, you can immediately tell whether something came out of an optimization code or not. If you look at the coefficients, nice coefficients did not come out of an optimization code. Ugly coefficients, they came out of an optimization code. But here, the coefficients came out pretty out of an optimization code. Doesn't happen very often. We're noting it. OK, what do we do here? So I've spent a lot of time looking at this, and it looks very simple to me now. But I realized when I was working, Zach and I spent a whole afternoon with Victor DeCaria trying to explain to him what it is that we're actually doing here. So let me try. OK. My first stage of the nth time step is going to look back at my n minus first time step, but at the second stage of my n minus first time step, at my un, at my second first stage of the n minus first time step. You may ask, why didn't I put the first stage of this n minus first time step first? But it's because I had a negative sign, and I don't like my negative signs in the beginning. All right, so anyway, first stage of my n minus first time step, second stage of my n minus first time step, and third stage of my n minus first time step, and of course, un. So I'm just taking a combination. Now, the thing to note here is that this is all old time steps and old stages. I don't mind that I have previous stages because the legacy code is in blue. The legacy code is hit twice, this backward Euler over here and this backward Euler over here. The key is that f is hideous. We do not want to see it. We don't want to know what it looks like. And we certainly don't want to code it up. We want to interrogate this legacy code to give us the backward Euler. We input into this legacy code this pre-filtered yn. So instead of just using un like I normally would, I use yn1, which is the first stage of my nth time step. And I hit it with the legacy code. And now this result came out of the legacy code, so I'm allowed to use it. And now I use un again. I use the term that I just computed, the second stage of my nth method. I use the n minus first, the last final stage of the time step before. And I use the first stage, the one that I computed over here. So this step over here uses un, uses this intermediate stage, and this intermediate, sorry, this intermediate stage and this intermediate stage. And it uses um, the final stage of the prior step, the one before the final stage. And then when I'm done with that second filter, now I hit it with a legacy code again, and I get this implicit Euler. The key observation here is that I'm doing complicated things that I don't have to know about, and I'm doing very simple linear combinations that I can handle. Now, 
This method is a stable. The implicit stages are just backward Euler. If you take your Taylor expansions, you'll tell me that I lied. These methods are second order, not third order. I'm sure you're all sitting here doing the Taylor expansions now. If you take the Taylor expansions, this looks second order. But here we took advantage of a different theory. And this is part of the reason I really like this project, because we were able to pull in something that we weren't expecting to pull in from here. So years ago, there were several papers on what was called quasi-consistency theory. Regretfully, I didn't know about them. And a colleague and I started working on something that we thought was very novel and innovative, and we called it error inhibiting schemes. I, our first paper was not that novel and innovative. It did actually give us some results and some improvements over the papers we didn't know about. Later on, we found out there were the other, other papers. These error inhibiting or quasi consistent or super convergent, super convergent is a great name, isn't it? Right? It just means it converges better than whatever you thought it should converge. So. Um, so quasi-consistency was the name that it was given in the literature that we didn't know about. We called it error-inhibiting schemes. Error-inhibiting schemes work as follows. They essentially give you one order higher than the Taylor expansions give you because at every stage they annihilate the first term in the truncation error. We don't see a matrix here. I'll show it to you in a minute. You have a matrix here. We don't see one. But you have a matrix here, and that matrix is multiplying your prior solution. And that prior solution is the exact solution plus error terms. And that matrix, when it hits the first error term, it kills it. So that first error term doesn't accumulate. And since it doesn't accumulate, you end up getting third order instead of second order. That was the short version. Here's the long version. You can write a GLM in a particular kind of general linear method, methods that are multi-step and multi-stage, but also have the nice feature where every stage has the same order. You know, usually with a Rangakata method, every stage has its own order, and usually not a very good order. But when you combine them at the end, they all cancel out and they give you a high order. GLMs can do that too, but there are some GLMs that known as peer methods, that have the same order for all of the stages. Um, you can write out this method in a matrix vector form. So you take this solution Vn, and Vn includes, it's a vector. It includes Un, and maybe it includes Un minus a third, and Un minus one. It includes a few um, levels between the two time levels. And you write it out as a linear combination. So over here, you have your D matrix, which moves things forward. And then you have the parts that are differentiation parts. This part over here is clearly an explicit part. This part over here looks very implicit, right? Uh, it, it kind of is implicit. If R is lower, strictly lower triangular, that's explicit too. But it's explicit in the sense that you compute your first row, and then you can compute your second row explicitly, and then you can compute your third row explicitly. because the matrix is strictly lower triangular. If this matrix is lower triangular but not strictly lower triangular, you will have a diagonally implicit method. And if you have the misfortune of working with a full matrix R, then you will have a fully implicit method. Okay, but this is how you can write this GLM. And the thing to note is that A and R, these matrices of coefficients, have a delta T attached to them. But D does not, and D is operating on Vn. Now, what we want to do is take a look at what our errors look like here. So our tau j are our truncation errors, and they satisfy a formula that has to do with our coefficients. And we count it this way. If tau j is equal to 0 for 1, 2, 3, up to p, then your truncation, your local truncation error that's not normalized by delta t is order delta t to the p plus 1. And then the errors gather up, and you get order delta t to the p. Now, this is a little bit controversial. I come from, from a place where our local truncation errors are always normalized by delta t. 
And so our global errors are of the same order as the local errors. But the rest of the world doesn't always agree with me yet. And in many cases, you take the local truncation error without normalizing by delta t so that you actually just look at what does your expansion look like. And then what we typically say in that case is that you have a certain order, but that that error from that order builds up over time. And when it builds up over time, you lose one order of accuracy. So here we're using the notation where you lose an order of accuracy. So if tau j is 0 for 1 up to p, you get pth order finally in the global error. But the truncation error enters into the next time step through the, make, through the method, through the formula. And when tau p plus 1, the first guy that's not 0, the first truncation error vector that's not 0, if that term lives in the null space of d, then when d multiplies it, it goes away. And then that term never has a chance to build up. It's annihilated at every step. It's inhibited. The error is inhibited. Hence, we call it error inhibiting method. I don't remember why they called it quasi-consistent method. I guess because it wasn't really zero. It was just d times it was zero. So in that case, if the first p truncation error vectors are zero, and the p plus first truncation error is not zero, but it lives in the null space of d, then you get a bonus. You pick up this error extra order of accuracy. OK, now, same method that I wrote before. This is what it looks like. This is how it's implemented. This is how I write it as a GLM, or how I write it as a pure method. I'm just rewriting it to fit the notation. If I write it in the second form, you don't have to follow those details, OK? Just, I'm writing it in this form. The key is that now I have n minus a third and n plus two thirds and terms like that instead of y1, y2, y3. I can write this in a matrix system. And this is what my matrix system looks like. If I have un and un minus a third, this is what it looks like. I'm going to have to ask you to believe me, because it, it's not pretty to show it. It's not difficult, but it's just not pretty. Now, the truncation error lives in the null space of that initial matrix, the one that's up here. That first surviving term of the truncation error lives in that null space, and therefore we get third order accurate results. So again, let me go back to the method originally. This method over here has a very simple combination of steps and stages, followed by something I don't have to look at because it's inside the legacy code, followed by another simple linear combination of steps and stages, followed by another thing that I don't have to know anything about. I just run it and I get a result. And when I do this, I have a method that is A-stable, that is not messing with my legacy code, and that is third order. Now, I love creating new methods. It's, very, it's a very pleasant and soothing kind of exercise sometimes. Um, but in the end, I want somebody to use these methods, and I want these methods to beat out previous methods. That's where my competitive streak comes out just a little bit. So we tested these. And by we tested these on a code, I don't mean that I saw this code. I mean that Victor de Carrier tested this on a code that he had been working on for years. And I think that what I'm saying here is correct. I did check it with Victor. It's a finite element code. It's a Navier-Stokes equations. Um, the problem is a, a offset cylinder inside a cylinder. So you have a broader cylinder, and then you have a little, you'll see the picture in a minute. But then you have a little cylinder on the inside. The Reynolds numbers are between 120 and 600, presumably. So I've been told. Um, when I run this, I see, so I run it, ran it on a bunch of these methods. Victor ran it on a bunch of these methods. The error inhibiting third order scheme was the most stable. And it was also very accurate. So 
I'm going to skip this for the moment. We can go back to those, but they're very, they're not really pleasant for almost five o'clock in the afternoon. So let's start with this. Okay. On the left is my reference solution at time t equals 10, t equals 20, and t equals 30. The reference solution apparently took months to run and was painful to develop. You see here you have the cylinder on the outside, you have the little cylinder on the inside, and the behavior here of the different vortices that are shed are what we kind of want to track. We want to have this quantitative behavior. If you really want the qualitative behavior, sorry, we want the qualitative behavior. If you want the quantitative behavior, I'll show you all those ugly tables anytime. Uh, but here we're just trying in the eyeball norm to see what works. This is what the implicit Euler looks like. Now, implicit Euler is very stable. It's beautifully stable. You know why it's so stable? It's because it diffuses like crazy. So look, uh, even after, even at t equals 10, my solution is already very diffused. This feature over here is gone. This feature over here doesn't exist. This feature over here. This guy over here is kind of around here. And this thing kind of almost survived. When I get to t equals 20 and t equals 30, the implicit Euler just doesn't live up. It's going to run. It's going to run forever because it's in supremely stable. I mean, until Roundoff kills it, you'll get beautiful smeared answers. But you won't get the accuracy you're looking for in the eyeball norm. Now, if I use this implicit Euler with the pre-filter, so this was the original, um, the first one that we tried, I see that I get a little bit better, particularly for time t equals 10. This is looking very similar qualitatively to the original method. But as I go forward in time, I see it smears out a little bit too much or more than I would like. This one is interesting. Do you remember this value of d? You actually do? Well, wow. OK, good. <laughs> All right, this is the value of d that we chose so that the method has third order when applied to a linear problem. This is very much a not linear problem. However, there are linear features, and the fact that you get this extra little bit of accuracy actually is surprisingly helpful. So if you look over here, well, it doesn't look any better than this one over here, but here it's looking a little better, and here you're still seeing a value that goes up here. You see how this one curves back in and connects? This one doesn't. This feature over here looks more like this one. These locations are not bad. It's not great, but it's surprisingly better than I would expect. So apparently the linear order condition is actually making a bit of a difference here. Now, this is the part I'm happy about. This method over here. Now, I have to be really fair, and, this, and I was. I was really fair. My method uses two backward Euler stages. So my method, the one all the way on the right, costs twice as much as the one on the left. But I didn't compare it with the same delta t. I doubled the size of delta t for my method. So this over here has double the delta t that this over here. Why is that good? It's, I mean, I expect it to be less good, but it's fair because I'm actually looking at the amount of work that the code is doing. Okay, So this is a delta t is twice as much. The behavior is really quite nice compared to the reference solution, even at t equals 30. You see this feature up here? That was not captured anywhere else. It is captured here. Little wiggle here. Locations are pretty much not too far off. This behavior over here is much better. The key is that this method costs you exactly the same as this method over here. But your results will be way better. All right, I'm a little bit tempted uh, to show you. A, no. If you want it, you'll ask for it. <laughs> Okay, so here are my conclusions. Time filtering. I'm not really an advertisement for time filtering. I, it's not something that I have worked with very deeply. It's not something that I un understand deeply. I do understand that you 
are scared of these legacy codes. I do understand that you can't afford to go in and mess with them, but that you need to improve upon them. And time filtering gives you a way of doing that. We can take any kind of multi-step method or Rangakata method or multi-step, multi-stage method, and we can pad it with a pre-filter and a post-filter. And as you saw, actually, we can couple them together with alternating filters. And you can obtain from this a new method that is a general linear method. That general linear method can be designed to have some advantageous properties, like a stability, like higher order, not like strong stability preserving or positivity preserving, unfortunately. And we constructed an optimization code that can play with these things and get them. I'm very happy that we were able to combine this approach, especially the alternating filter approach with the error inhibiting method. I thought that was a nice feature to be able to apply a little bit more of a numerical analysis-y feel by doing these, getting a higher order than you would just get from the truncation error analysis alone. And clearly, it actually does a good job in practice. And this actually did appear in JCP. I should have edited my slides since May. I prepared my slides for my visit in May. The paper has appeared in JCP. Um, it took us a very long time to write this paper. It took us a really long time to run the codes, and it took us a really long time to figure out which methods make it into the paper and which don't. But we're happy with how it turned out. What do we want to do in the future? Well, the truth is, I think that many of us have moved along to other problems. So maybe somebody else wants to do this in the future, though I was approached by a postdoc in Italy who wants to work on some of this. We can use this GLM, the General Linear Method Optimization Approach, to find other methods that have other desirable properties. SSP has not worked. Positivity preserving has not worked for the examples we gave. That doesn't mean it can't work for other problems. We need to look into that. Um, we want to consider nonlinear filtering. We want to consider adaptive filtering. Sometimes you want to filter, sometimes you don't want to filter. Maybe you want to filter with variable step size. Frankly, that scares me a little bit, but it looks like it should be an important thing. I really would like to continue working on finding these error-inhibiting time filters, because I think that's something that's, that's a little bit of a niche thing for us. And I think it's some place that we can adapt something that is more of theoretical interest and make it more practical. And honestly, we love the results that we got for the ones so we're encouraged to try something else. And we maybe would apply some of these methods to BDF2, which from one point of view is pretty much exactly the same as backward Euler, but of course in a more fundamental sense it's a totally different type of method. So we'd like to play with that as well. So uh, sometime maybe, or if you guys want to work on that, let me know and I'll uh, give you the benefit of whatever we've done so far. Thank you so much for inviting me and for being here today. Yeah, so initially, it would make sense, okay, yes and no, I, to coin a phrase. Um, if you rewrite things in enough forms, you can see that there are explicit steps, excuse me, implicit in the formulation. In other words, when you write certain things, you could actually write them out. We were careful not to have F interrogated directly. Um, and that was a limitation that um, Victor and Bill preferred very strongly that that be done. However, there's nothing in our formulation that prohibits it. Actually, we had to work to prohibit it in our formulation. So we did not do this. By design, we didn't do this. But it actually is easier to allow it to happen than to force it not to happen. 
I don't know what results it gives you, but it's easier to do from the optimization code point of view. Yes. So it seems like, from, probably from any nonlinear problem, that over a single time step, things are sort of behaving in linear, and you can kind of use these things. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to have that work well. But I was wondering about something like a nonlinear hyperbolic problem with the shock wave, where you really have a strong nonlinearity at the level of every time step. Have you looked at kind of applying these methods? We didn't, we didn't look at that. that actually, I'm not 100% sure. Let me think about whether we looked at it. I'll tell you what, the pro what we did, and I just can't remember what we looked at exactly. So maybe tw 12, 10 years ago, Bram van Leer asked me if what happens if you get a certain order, let's say fourth order for your nonlinear case. The motivation was that we couldn't get past fourth order and have a strong stability preserving method for an explicit method. So Bram van Leer had asked me, OK, you can't get past fourth order, but for a linear problem, can you get past fourth order? And I said, yes, for a linear problem, you could get whatever order you want. And I know how to do it exactly. I have an actual formula for it. And so he said, well, how about if you combine the two? How about if you go up to fourth order conditions for nonlinear, and then you add the linear condition, one linear condition for fifth order, one linear condition for sixth order, and so on. Can you get good methods there? And we actually published a, a paper to do that. And we did some numerical simulations as part of that paper. And I haven't the slightest recollection of what those were. But I'll look those up and send them to you. They are on my website. Um, I, I do know that the original motivation was to look at acoustic waves that are linear, that are happening in the background of a nonlinear process. And I do know that we certainly didn't study that. So. You find collaborators who know the answer to that? Um, certainly, I don't know the answer to that. I, don't, I, I do know that there are certain benchmarks out there, but I don't have enough expertise to be able to determine what's a good problem to do. Um, so that's really where collaborations are extremely helpful. What's nice about this is that we were able to provide our collaborators with methods that they would not have come up with. And they were able to provide us with challenging problems that could appear in JCP with uh, the reviewers being super happy about it. But to tell you more, I, I don't know. OK, well, thanks once again. I think Thank your you. reputation on Google is secure. I'm hope, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you very much once again. Thank you.